Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Hi, guys. How are you? Hey, Wendy. Hey, Wendy. We're good. How are you? Good to see you guys. Good to hear you guys. I'm glad that you're here. Yes, yeah, us as well. It's been a little while, I think, since we've recorded one of these. So it's good to good to hear you as well. Ah, oh, thank you. So, what do we got going on today? Oh, well, we have a we have a guest here uh, with us today, uh, Mr. Doug Dickey from DRDA CPAs. And Doug, thank you so much for being uh, a part of the podcast here today. Well, thank you for having. Me. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys. Yeah, welcome, Doug. Yeah, so we're we're gonna we're gonna talk to Doug and and as. My introduction to him was Doug. You are a CPA, and and we met a little while ago, and we've had a, a few calls and I with Doug and and what he's going to be talking about today. It was a topic that I think it may be a little bit more technical than some of the other ones that we've talked about here on the podcast, but I think it's a good one too. And and Doug, you're going to talk a little bit about really entity choice for for businesses, and more specifically uh, the use of C corporations after the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed quite a few years ago. And that's just how we got introduced to you is maybe you're seeing a lot more of that activity, I think, in structuring entities in C corporations versus maybe some others that we can get into. But that's what we wanted to talk about today. So again, we appreciate you being on here. Sure, and I'm happy to be on here and happy to talk about those concepts. It, It really can make a significant difference in people's lives and it's good for folks to have that information. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, so maybe Doug, if we could just jump in here and and can you sort of outline uh, for our listeners, you know, what what a C corporation is, and then maybe contrast that with perhaps some other entities that they may have maybe have more familiarity with, like an LLC or a partnership or an S corporation. So, talk a little bit about you know what a C corporation is, if you don't mind. Sure, no, I'm happy to do so. You know, when you're going into business, you always have a choice as to how you want to structure your operations. And that choice can have Im- implications in asset protection. It can have implications in tax planning and tax results, as well as purchasing power. So there's, a, there's an importance around understanding what you're trying to do and what options you have in order to be able to choose the right structure for you to operate your business now and perhaps even into the future, because it's, it's not unusual for a business to start off and maybe it's struggling in the beginning, but as it as it grows and expands, your your needs will change in the business just as your needs for structuring will change. So as you were alluding to, uh, the most people will choose a, a flow-through entity, something like an S-corporation, a partnership, or a disregarded entity, an LLC that's disregarded for tax purposes, to start their business. But since the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came out in the, the end of 2017, there's been a lot of folks who have added a C corporation or perhaps even changed their operating structures into a C corporation to take advantage of some of those changes. And and, and sort of an overview, C corporations stand alone. They're not flowing through. Like when you're talking about S corporations or partnerships or LLCs are disregarded, they don't pay tax. Whatever they earn from January 1st to December 31st, drop straight down to people's individual tax return. And what happens in that concept is that as people take W-2 wages or compensation for their services out of there, uh, that may put them into a tax bracket of, say, 32 to 35 percent simply on their W-2 wages. Right. But when they get their K-1 or profit allocation from those flow through entities, that additional K-1 profit allocation gets added on top of their W-2 wages driving them into the highest top tax brackets that uh, the law allows at this point. So all those profits ultimately gets taxed at perhaps a 37% rate for federal purposes, and in some states as high as a 13% uh, state rate. Well, compare that to a C corporation. And a C corporation, C, there's only one single flat tax rate, and that's 21% at the federal level. So whether you earn a dollar or a billion dollars, it's a flat 21% tax. 
Additionally, C corporations don't really make a distinction between long-term capital gains, short-term capital gains, operating income or interest income. They're all taxed at a flat 21%. So to the extent that you can structure activities to receive dollars in a lower taxed environment, then you ultimately end up with more after-tax profits to be able to grow your business or to grow your wealth. And that's a big yeah. that's a big change from where it was before 2017. Am I correct? That I think you're you're 100 correct. The before 2018, C corporations used to have tax brackets, just like we individuals do. The prior to 2018, C corporations, the first fifty thousand was taxed at 15 percent. The next 25,000 was taxed at 25%, then above 75,000 was taxed at 35 to 39%, depending upon income. Well, we still used C corporations in those days, but we would have to manage the taxable income to hopefully just take advantage of those two lower tax brackets of 15 and 25%. In those days, that combined $75,000 worth of income had an average rate of 17.67% when you blend those two together. Well, that had been the case for decades prior to 2018. And in those decades, individual tax rates could be as high as 60 and 70%. Right, those I that. And so the reality is there was still an arbitrage between the tax rates and C corporations and individuals, but it was limited to pretty much a, a, a $75,000 threshold. Well, effective January 1st, 2018, that all went away. There's now just a single flat 21% tax rate. And so it allows for much more robust planning as far as how you structure your activities and your income streams and purchasing. Decisions. Hey, Doug, a lot of our clients, obviously, they might not be as clear on all the entity structures, but the pushback on C corporations has always been the double tax. You want to walk through what that really sure. is and how that kind of operates? Because people sure. get confused. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you have a flow through entity like an S corporation or a partnership, there is a single level of tax because remember the entity does not pay tax. Whatever the profits are flow straight out to the individual and are taxed at whatever their tax rates are. So let's assume that you're in a 37% individual tax rate and you have a hundred dollars coming through as profits out of that entity to you, whether it's a partnership or an S corporation, it doesn't matter. It's $100 of profits dropping down to the individual's tax return. If they're in a 37% tax bracket, they'll pay $37 in tax. Now let's compare that to running $100 through a C corporation. And a C corporation, remember it's a flat 21% tax rate. So if you have $100 of income in a 21% tax bracket, you'll pay $21 in tax. That would leave $79 profit in that corporation after tax. Let's assume you don't want to reinvest those dollars into the growth of your business. You don't want any additional benefits. You don't want any additional wealth accumulation. You want to consume that dollar and bring it out to you as an individual. Well, when you take after-tax profits from a corporation and you distribute them to shareholders, you are subject to a dividend tax. That's the second tier of tax or that double tax concept that John was just speaking about. And so the reality is, if I've paid $21 in corporate level tax and I've paid a dividend tax, dividends are max taxed at 20%. 20% of $79 means I would have paid about $16 in dividend tax, right? So that's the double tier. But if you do the math and you paid $21 in corporate level tax and $16 in dividend level tax, you would have paid $37 in tax to bring $100 through a C corporation and out to you individually, which is exactly what you would have paid originally with the flow through entity. And in fact, that's how Congress reached that 21%. Yeah, I was going to say, that's how they figured it out, those boys in Washington. That's it. And when, yeah. when the House and the Senate was negotiating, 
uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and they were trying to come up with what is the appropriate rate for C corporations. They arrived at 21% so they could achieve parity between flow-through entities and C corporations. So that's exactly the, the basis for why that number came about. So, so back to that concept, you know, ultimately, if you're in a 37% tax bracket, you'll end up in the same place. It's just when you get end up there, right? If you're if it's in a flow through entity and you're paying tax on those profits every year, you'll pay that tax by April 15th of the following year. Well, if you're in a C corporation and you're going to use that $79 remaining after its original 21% corporate tax to reinvest in your business and grow it, you don't have to pay that second tier of tax because you're not pulling it out for consumption. You're reinvesting it in the growth of your business. Yeah, and, and Doug, you just kind of alluded to a question I was just going to ask, which is, you know, we work with a lot of business owners that they're in high growth mode. So if they are, if they do generate profits beyond what their normal expenses are in their company, they, a lot of them want to reinvest that back into the company. They don't want to take it out for personal consumption. So if I'm following you correctly, this having a C corporation, am I correct in saying is maybe a more tax efficient structure if you had that goal for your business? Yeah, if your intention is to not consume all of your earnings, then wouldn't it make sense to have more after-tax earnings to grow? So yeah, you're absolutely right. And 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 I'm not I'm not anti S corp or partnership or LLC by any sure. stretch of the imagination. That, that's very common. Most of our clients have those. So so the the reality is, it's a good way to structure a business, especially in the beginning when you may have losses or or things aren't quite as profitable in the beginning. But as your profits start to grow to a point where you have earnings in excess of what you need for personal consumption for things like housing, food, clothing, vacations, that sort of thing, when you have those additional dollars that would in essence be savings, then are you saving those dollars to reinvest in and grow your business? Most entrepreneurs do that. Or are you wanting to put it into qualified plans or other types of things for personal use? As long as you're not consuming it today, why would you want to subject it to a higher tax rate? Hey, Doug, is it is it is it an industry that you're in that gives you the benefit or not to a C? Is 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 that a specific conversation? No, it, it, it's really industry agnostic. The concept of of using C corporations in conjunction with operating companies has been around for a long time. Now. The management services organization concept that we use these in oftentimes was you know, certainly been widely adopted in the healthcare industry. You see a lot of physicians, uh, hospital groups, uh, dental practices, surgical centers, a lot of those types of folks have been using management services organizations for years to achieve economies of scales and efficiencies of operations by taking those commonly utilized resources and pulling them into one entity. But, but the reality is it's, it's, it really doesn't matter the industry. <clears throat> it's simply a business concept. It's taking your commonly utilized resources, putting them in an environment that's able then to be used for all of your businesses and choosing a tax structure that gives you the ability to be able to keep more of what you work hard for to earn every day. Yeah, because S corporations, because they, again, we, we have a lot of our clients with LLCs and S corporations. And the, the fact that it's a flow through, <laughs> There's always a balance between how much income they take out from a salary standpoint and the rest comes out as a distribution from that particular entity. They, they really have no choice but to get that K1. I mean, that, that's the, that, that's the lack of tax arbitrage that you're talking about. So, so the C, so the C concept is it, simple is that if you are growing your enterprise to your point earlier, you don't have to take that out. You could continue to invest into your company and only pay 21% on those dollars, which is, which that, I think that conversation has to be had across the board with a lot of, a lot of business entities that are structured as LLCs and S currently. Maybe there should be a shift. Well, what do you see in the marketplace? Is that, is that happening more so than not? Or people aren't really yeah. paying attention to that? You know, it's certainly happening more than it used to, but there's still yeah. so many people that haven't really thought through that. And right, right exactly. There's a lot of CPAs and tax attorneys that haven't necessarily thought thought through that either. But even if you're looking at a difference between 21% and 37% ta tax, that 16%, 16 may not sound like a big number, oh, but if you're in a 37% tax bracket, it's about a fourth more profit accumulation after tax every year. So it's like every four years, you get another year of, of profit without having to see another customer sell another widget or see another patient. And so why wouldn't you structure your way within the guidelines of the law 
your your operations in such a way that you are able to keep more of what what you work for. Yeah, I mean that that to me it's it, and and that, I like that analogy that you just used there, but but it does give you more flexibility, I think, from the standpoint of you can decide if you want to keep it in the company to grow, you're going to get that that arbitrage, as you mentioned, and in the event that you want to take some funds out of the company for personal use, then that's a dividend tax. And to your point earlier, Doug, you're you're paying the same collective rate between those two as you would if you just had a pass through entity from the beginning, exactly. but you have that flexibility. So, yeah, I think and that it's that's, your choice as to timing too, right? I mean, you, right, you're going right. to pay the same. You may pay you may pay that second tier of tax five years, ten years, fifteen years from now, as opposed to today, and money has a time value. Well, speaking of that, are there any rules around you know when companies that are structured as C corporations need to take dividends? Is, is are there policies sure. that that companies use or or rules tax wise? Because I would have yeah. to think that um, you know the government you know knows to your point that they wanted to maybe have parity between pass through entities and C corporations, but you know if you never take a dividend, now they're they're losing tax dollars if more businesses yeah. are structured as C corps. That's so sad to me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that they're not a, getting more tax dollars. I'm sorry, I didn't make that comment. <laughs> there, there is a, a tax concept that's been around for a long time on, on the on the tax books, and that's something called an accumulated earnings tax for C corporations. And to give you an idea of how how old those statutes and provisions are, uh, C corporations. If you read the provisions, says C corporations should not accumulate more than $250,000 of capital, uh, retained earnings in essence, without a valid business reason. Well, think about that for a minute. Exxon and Microsoft are C-corporations. I think they probably have more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of retained earnings. In those I hope so. We're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the largest businesses on earth are, are C corporations, right? And so the 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 idea that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars would be an exorbitant amount of capital is you know pretty antiquated. But the, the important part that most people don't focus in on if they actually even read that provision is that that second point of without a valid business reason. Well, how many businesses have you seen that don't that have too much time or too much money, right? They're, they're, you're you're going to accumulate capital because you need capital to grow a business. A growing business, the first casualty is usually cash flow, so you need capital to support that. You're going to buy equipment, you're going to buy plant facilities, you're going to expand, you're going to use it for being able to put in place deferred compensation plans to reward key employees and put golden handcuffs on folks that you know are going to be needed as a part of the future of the company. And at, uh, at some point, if you have partners, you know, there's going to be a partner buyback. So you fund that with either life insurance or through capital accumulation in businesses. And so you just have to have a valid business reason. And, it, and you usually don't have to look very, very far to have a valid business reason to accumulate capital right. in a business. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the, the MSO model earlier. We'll get into that in our next podcast with you. But more specifically, anybody that's listening today that owns a business, are you suggested or or should they consider sitting with their current CPA team and review this as an option? Is that is that a recommendation that you would kind of send out to everybody listening to this podcast that owns a business? Sure. Sure. I mean, to, to the extent that their current CPA or attorneys are, are, and financial advisors are familiar with it, absolutely. I mean, I think anybody that's got earnings in excess of their consumption and is looking to grow their business and accumulate capital – should look at this structure and any other structure they can to be able to improve the tax efficiency of their operations. Yeah, no, and 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 that's what that, that's why we wanted to have you on here, Doug, because I think and and you alluded to this earlier as well in terms of you know for decades and certainly for my career, uh, which is you know shorter than I think both of yours, at least in terms of my <laughs> my age. But you know, I mean, I remember even being you are forty one today. Michael, yes, so yes, you get uh, close. <laughs> it is my birthday today. Um, Johnny, the, he's still younger than we are, John. Yeah, so he's still. I got belts older than him. Well, I was going to say is you know there was always this you know the you know the structure of you know only C corporation is only for the really really large companies and really you know if you're in the private sector. More often than not, you were advised to structure your business as the, one of those pass-throughs, whether it's an, an S corp or an LLC. I, and yeah. I think you know we wanted to have you on to kind of maybe just 
enlighten our our listeners that hey maybe that's not always the case anymore so you know i think that this is this has been this is this is good. great right. conversation I mean, there's a reason why those large corporations use c corporations right there's a there's a number of other benefits that that, uh, that come along with that structure besides just the tax difference but you're 100 percent right this is not just for publicly traded companies or for large corporations if you have any kind of significant earnings in excess of uh of what of what your consumption is, uh, then you certainly should be considering this as a part of your overall business structure. And, and there was something uh, I think in that code as well. I don't I don't recall way back when. Wasn't there a option that that corporations that had money overseas were able to bring it in at a fifty percent bracket? Is that was that part of that structure? Well, yeah, there, there's some components about when you have a a foreign subsidiary, then you right. have some additional some reduced tax rate or repatriating income. But uh, some of that got wiped out by the uh, guilty provisions yep. you know, that came in in 2017 that. as well. And so, uh, yeah, that there, corporations are just a different set of tax rules. And quite frankly, that's the whole reason why we're looking at it. When, to, to me, when, you, when you're looking at tax planning and business planning and structuring, it, it, you have to play by the rules, but the rules are different, right? The rules, tax rules for individuals versus S corporations or partnerships or disregarded entities are different than C corporations or trusts or estates. And so if you're looking at how to structure income and structure activities associated with that income, why wouldn't you look at the pros and cons of each of those different types of structures and determine what's the best way to be able to structure what you do each day? Yeah. And, and it kind of a this popped into my head, Doug, and, and I don't know what experience you have with this at your firm, but are you seeing more of the, the pairing of, again, in light of Tikja and and this flat twenty one percent income tax at uh, the C corp level. Are you seeing more uh, companies pair that with the Section twelve hundred two small business exclusion provision you know, as well? You know, I have seen a few more of those. The twelve hundred two is a provision that allows for a small uh, privately held business to to be sold as a stock sale and exclude a portion of the sales price from any kind of tax, which is a wonderful thing. Here, there are some provisions that, that under 1202 that you have to abide by as far as working capital and use of funds and things like that during the operations of the company. But assuming that you meet those guidelines, then you have the ability to sell the company perhaps as a stock sale and uh, avoid tax going up to like $10 million worth of the sales price. Here, here's the situation though, is that more most of the time, more often than not, Small businesses, small middle market businesses are sold as asset sales rather than stock sales. And 1202 only applies to stock sales. Right. But right. we have had uh, clients that, that that sell their businesses as stock sales. And I, I see it more often with clients who have very strong and important contract rights or uh, licensing rights. Like uh, I have, we see them with the radio stations and TV stations where you have the uh, FCC licenses are very hard to get, and so you don't want to disrupt that. Or I have clients who have um, licenses with you know, NFL and Major League Baseball and NBA and every college and Marvel and Disney and those types of folks. And so negotiating all those intellectual property rights and licensing rights for being able to use their logos and their information is a valuable asset in itself. And so uh, if you you can't really sell Disney's contracts, is it right? I mean, right. Disney's not going to allow that. And so so being able to have a stock sale in those types of, of circumstances can preserve the value and it, and it makes it worthwhile. Uh, there are obviously tax differences between selling a, the company's assets versus selling the, the stock even outside of 1202. But but that's that's when I see stock sales come to pay, to be more than than not. Uh, but I have seen more um, elements of 1202 probably in the past five years than I have in the, the you know 20 years or so before that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Doug, I, this has been fantastic. I think we're running out of time, but I I do want to have uh, you on for part two. And you you mentioned these MSO management services organizations a little earlier. Um, would love to maybe dig into that a little bit more and in, in sort of part two, but. Uh, before that, I really just wanted to thank you again for being a part of this. I think this is really a, a great podcast, and yeah, I think our you, listeners Doug. got a lot out of it. Thank you, John Michael. Appreciate you guys having me, and look forward to to the next uh, segment. Anytime, we as well. Thanks. All right, and we've got a birthday. Happy birthday, Michael! Thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, enjoy and. 
thank you for joining us today. Please like, follow, and share this podcast with your friends. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. American Portfolios and Copper Beach Financial Group are not affiliated with any other named business entities mentioned. To the extent that this material concerns tax matters, it is not intended or written to be used and cannot be used by a taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding penalties that may be imposed by law. Each taxpayer should seek tax, legal, or accounting advice from a tax professional based on his or her individual circumstances. APFS Compliance has conducted its review of the PMR electronic submission related to your outside RIA material.